<laughs> Welcome to the Dreams by Any Means Motivation Station. I'm your host, Ed Doxon. Um, today, I have a very special guest. I'm really, really, really super excited about the guest that's featured here today. Um, um, before I go into how we met, I'm going to just say introducing to the CEO of the National Association of Black Accountants. It's Galene St. Juice. I said your name right, correct? I didn't say it right? <laughs> no, it's Guylaine. It's Guylaine St. Juice, and I serve as the president and CEO of NADA Inc. As you know, Ed, we're in the process of relaunching our brand as NADA Inc., and mm -hmm. sort of keeping the National Association of Black Accountant as sort of our history. Um, okay. But we, you know, if you look at everything we're producing, it's NABA Inc. empowering Black business leaders at every point of the journey. Okay, nice. NABA Inc. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm ex excited to have you here. Um, what I was Thank say you for having me. I'm humbled and excited to have to be with you too. You're the one who's doing the real work on the yeah. ground. And so I'm so super thrilled to be with you. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, uh, part of the podcast I started this is really just to show people the power of networking. So, you know, it's really started off with most people that have been in my network. Um, if I was a kid, if I used to work with, went to college, whatever the case is. But also, as I continue to meet people, um, I'm inviting them here on the show. So um, it's crazy how I was at NABA. I found out I was going to NABA like a day before. Uh, my job had called me. It was like, hey, you're down there in uh, Fort Lauderdale. We need to drive to Hollywood. Um, so went up there to help with some diversity work and end up meeting you in the hallway, you know, just so random, um, ran into each other and meeting you. Nothing great. is random in life, right? There's no yeah. such thing as coincidence. <laughs> it all happens at the time it is ordained to happen. So at least that's right. what I believe. Yeah. So, you know, exchanging that good energy and uh, following up here today. So definitely want to thank you for, you know, putting the time to the side. I know you have a busy schedule. Um, to really talk uh, to, uh, to oh, me. Like I said, I'm honored to be with you, Ed. I, I love your energy. I love your enthusiasm. First of all, thank you for joining us at the convention. I know we need to get yeah. this on the road, but at a different time, I would love to get your feedback on the convention. Yeah. We are starting to build um, Insight 2023. And so hearing from all of our partners and all of our guests will certainly help us continue yeah. to elevate the experience. Absolutely, for sure. And, um, you know, did some research. I know you have a really extensive background, a lot of things to accomplish. But, you know, let's just start off, you know, before everything that you, you know, got into, been able to do and accomplish before getting there. Let's talk about, you know, where you grew up at, um, you know, some of your childhood influences and things like that. You know, I love the fact that you start that way, Ed, because, you know, I always tell people leadership starts with us. It starts with them, right? If you don't know who you are, you can't be a leader, which is for us at NABA and for me, being a person that others want to follow and follow willingly, right? And so for me, I, um, I was born and raised in Haiti, that's the very French name. Mm -hmm. I migrated to the United States as a young adult right before my 18th birthday. And so it, I've defined myself now as a Hamerican because <laughs> I will, oh, you know, Hamerican is what I am. Um, I um, will never give up of my heritage, right? Because my, my roots are very much Haitian. I watch myself, even though I am more conversive in business language in English, but at, when I'm fully at rest, I think in French and Creole, those are really my first languages. Yeah. I speak them without an accent. The English one will always be tinted. Oh. You know, it, I, I have to spice it up, <laughs> you know, and so on. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and so I just and yet my entire adult life has been in a, in in the in these United States, right? And yeah. so what I realize is how common my experience as a black woman in this country is compared to any black woman. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the nuances that it brings because of where I grew up right? And having a different perspective and a different view. And that's why I, you've heard me say often, Black is beautiful. And we need to recognize yeah. that just like there are nuances, not all Latinx are the same, not all Hispanics are the same, not all white is the same, etc. Right. That in the Black experience, there are nuances for those of us who are Caribbean, coming to this country for those who are born in the motherland in Africa, in all the different countries of Africa that have migrated here. And then for blacks in America that we refer to as African-American. Yep. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, um, you know, I saw your background 
you 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 have a, a lot of I'll say experience working in diversity, inclusion, those type of things. So, yeah, but it's interesting to hear you know your upbringing, those things. Like you said, leadership starts with us, and I know in my experience, it kind of. Um, Working in those DNI spaces, having those conversations, um, I think some people don't get that it's really deeper than just you know, hey, let's bring someone in or let's reach this number. But it's like really understanding and you know making these cultures still belong and things like that. So definitely, thank you for sharing that with the audience. Of course, and then the other piece of myself that I will share with your audience is, I was raised by a single mom as an only child, and so okay. never confuse social with being introverted. I'm a, yeah. I'm a social individual, but deeply introverted because yeah. I definitely am comfortable being by myself. Yeah, yeah, I'm only yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think Black women are powerful because I grew up in a matriarchy, right? My grand, you know, I, I grew up in a, in sort of like a community where my great-grandmother was there, my grandmother was there. I was surrounded by aunts and cousins and so on. We never, I didn't have many friends because amongst ourselves, we were enough. <laughs> so, so commitment to tribe right, is deeply, deeply embedded in who I am. And at the same time, um, you know, one of the pieces that I, in this, what you call this DI space, that I am aware of is that all the data outcomes suggest that Black women are at the bottom of the rock in mm. this country. And yet for me, I grew up in a, you know, in, in, in a family where women ruled the nest, right? And yeah. so just sort of like bringing those those two together every day is definitely an interesting thing for me. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. How, how was, you know, you said to being raised by, you know, family of women, strong women leaders, you know, what were some of the early traits that you picked up from them? So that's a really good question, Ed. I like it. Um, so I think that what I saw with all the women in my family that were leaders is that they were definitely collaborative in terms of like bringing people together and there was never a sense of a zero sum game. Yeah. The idea that for somebody to winning meant somebody has to lose, right? But rather this idea, you know, and I'm using, you know, an Afro, um, Afro-American language that the tide rises all boats, right? That the idea of once the, the, and, and this concept of overlooking the, the matriarch who overlook over the family and the tribe, men that all are taken care of. So a very nurturing style you know, of leadership, which means we look after our own, we take care of our own, right? Very much ingrained as well. And then the third um, observation that I've made from um, growing up is this idea that everyone had a voice, right? So when we would sit down for dinners or gathering as family members, yeah. Even the kids were part of the conversation, like everybody had a voice, but ultimately we knew who was going to have the final say. Right. And when that person had the final say, you didn't find us grumbling on the side enough because, you know, we have felt that, you know, everybody said what they need to say, a decision needs to be made and it got made. And I think it, it, it really you know, we were able to be incredibly supportive of one another, but at the same time, very organized in the way that we got stuff done. And so for me, it's no wonder that we got, my grandmother in particular, got so much done without yeah. as much resources. When you look at what she accomplished, she, the resources could seem unmatched. Yeah. Right? And so... Um, really, really important that, you know, we talk about that. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely, for sure. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned in the beginning, and so I'm from D.C., um, but I've been residing down here uh, for a lot of the Miami area for the last three years. And, um, you know, of course, being down here, I meet, I mean, almost everyone I've met down here has Haitian background. But um, I want to ask this question because it's always something people talk about, you know, where, do you, where does the, that relentless spirit, you know, with people with, like from Haiti, where does that come from? It is in our DNA. Right? I mean, when you think about it, we were the first Black Republic self govern nation in the world. Right? I mean, part of what I, I'm so sad about this whole debate in this country about critical race theory and what people focus on as opposed to the truth 
is the real importance that Haiti had for slaves in the South yeah. and why the system was orchestrated to squeeze, you know, this new country of oxygen, right? Um, certainly we have our share of responsibility for the state of our country and the state of our nation. I, I do not run away from that either. But, you know, to, if you really think about it, this were a group of uneducated slaves that managed to organize despite a brutal system and not only rebel, but manage to chase the most powerful army in the world off of their land, right? And when you start to realize the strategy, because I studied Haitian history behind it, this is like unbelievable, right? There's a reason they did it on January 1st, because they knew that the masters and the colons would be partying on December 31st and that a lot of them would be passed out from all their celebration and yeah. so they hit them at the early morning of January 1st. I mean, that's brilliant, right, brilliant right. strategy. <laughs> I mean, do you know what I mean? Like, but to the knowledge of it, yeah. I will share with you that what I, um, as somebody who studies peace, right, I'm, I'm a pacifist. I am attracted of you know, that's where my faith is born from, right? When I say I'm a Jesuit or follow the teaching, you know, I, I love the work of Gandhi and mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu. I am, that's what I'm most attracted to. That's what my soul sort of draws light from. Mm -hmm. I were, you know, I sometimes think about, well, what is that history of violence because of the way they did it? But, and that's how I learn also about how anger can be powerful, but how we have to resist the urge of act in anger. And I don't judge because you know what? These people were brutalized and they found a way to remove the oppressors off of their back. And they did it in such an incredible way. And yeah. never stopped fighting, right? And so I will tell you, I say this, um, a big part of why I'm American also is all that heritage. Yeah. And so what that shows up for me as a leader is I tell everybody, don't count on me to start conflict. I will never start conflict. I will never start discordance or dissonance. And, you know, that's never going to come from me. However, if you start and you push me there, I'm going to finish it. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. That, that's, that's great to hear. And I know, you know, just being in that corporate space with diversity, belonging, inclusion, um, I can see how that plays a role. And, you know, when it comes to, I, I don't know how active you are, have been when it comes to employee resource groups or it comes to just like put a certain culture in place and things like that. But I'm sure that has shaped your, you know, understanding. And, you know, I think just sympathizing and sensitivity to other cultures, um, you know, in that corporate workspace. What I would tell everybody, that's where my commitment to the truth comes from. Because I hope even in talking about this, you're hearing the, I respect all that has happened and I recognize that the violence of the way we did it is very different than what Martin Luther King led yeah. and all the people that I follow. I forgot to talk about Dr. King, of course, right? Um, I have often said that the trajectory of Haiti would have been different if the French had not killed Toussaint Louverture, who was really the mastermind behind the Haitian independence. And that's why they had to take him down. Um, and you know what, my commitment to education, because Toussaint was very educated, Desali not so much, and the others that you know were around him, because of course it was illegal to teach slaves um, to um, read and write, right? And um, Toussaint was also a diplomat that right. knew how to sort of bring people alongside. So I hope that if any Haitian is listening to this, that they do not interpret this to say that I am not a pro desaline or criticizing this. I mean, that is not the intention at all. It yeah. is just, I hope that in self-reflection as leaders, we can draw the best from those that we respect the most. 
honor our heritage and at the same time ask ourselves what are the places what are the places spaces tactics tra strategies intention that we might do differently right mm -hmm. and recognizing that our independence was earned at the price of of bloodshed i mean a lot of bloodshed because this alien said it coupe yeah. get Bulekai. Kupe Ted Bulekai said, if you all don't get out, I'm going to cut your heads off and I'm going to burn down your plantation, right? <laughs> and so, and, and that's not who I am, right? Yeah. But at the, at the same end, you're not going to oppress me, right? right. You're not going to oppress me. You're not going to not tell the truth about the power of Black people. Mm -hmm. You're not going to continue to oppress us, you know, at the service of yeah. protecting as mm -hmm. the book calls it, you know, fragile ego, right? This idea that, you know, D'Angelo talks about white fragility, but yeah. that we are going to be really, really, really focused on telling the truth, but a truth that heals, a truth that binds us together, a truth that recognizes the opportunities that are ahead of us in this country and around the world. And the right. truth that says what we've done the past 400 years, let it never be repeated again, right? Mm -hmm. And let us really be clear about what are the systems that are creating those systems of inequities and inequalities, right? Both within our communities, our society, our country, but quite frankly, Ed, around the world. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, it's refreshing to hear this, you know, um, myself, I'm still very early working in corporate America, but knowing your background, um, and as we're talking about, you know, black heritage, black people, um, a question that arises a lot, um, I sometimes get it, but I also sometimes wonder, and sometimes it's a question because a lot of people, um, I think can't do this. How did you, and how do you keep your identity, you know, while being in these spaces and being in these corporate spaces where a lot of times people don't look like you, they don't come from your background. Like, how do you keep that identity and not lose sight of your history? So first I will answer, to answer your question is like, look at my name, it's really hard to hide away from my identity, uh -huh. right? <laughs> You know, how many times do I hear people saying, where are you from? Because, you know, they read my name and they're like, okay, yeah. how do I even begin to say that, right? right. And so that's <laughs> I open my mouth and, you know, like I just made a joke about it. It's like, you know, the, the English comes out, but it yeah. is, hinted. you know, you can't avoid it, right? Right. Um, and I just am somebody to add that I don't like pride, right? I, I try not to be proud of things or proud of myself because of all that comes in the word pride, I get to get a sense of satisfaction, a sense of fulfillment, a, a sense of appreciation for something that I've done or things like that. Mm -hmm. I would tell you, I have a lot of respect and context and um, there I see pride in my heritage. Right, I am incredibly proud of what Haiti stands for. Yeah. Right, there is a reason why the French. I don't know if people know this. That's why I said to people, you gotta educate yourself. Right, I'm a you know Bob Marley says, none but ourselves can free our minds. Redemption song. Right, yeah. we gotta learn about this history. Right, but what I mean, I studied it. I know it. I researched it. What most people may not know is that when Haiti got her in, got its independence, it was considered the um, pearl of the Antilles. That's how we. That's how Haiti was referred to, the pearl of the Antilles. And it, the French, paid America to enforce the embargo on Haiti. And what folks don't understand, I, I hope people know, but I don't mean to be um, patronizing at all. But the reason they did that is because they knew that yeah. the French, that American Southern slave owners had a very good reason to not want to see Haiti prosper. Mm -hmm. Because you know what, to have Black people 
own land, rule country, you know, sort of stand in as royalty. Because, you know, our first, you know, when, when Jean-Jacques Dessalines got the independence, he proclaimed himself an emperor because that's all he knew, right? So that those are all the impact of colonization that we don't talk about, right? We repeat what we've seen the oppressor do to us. So he named himself emperor because that's what he knew. And that was a very scary thought to Southern slave owners because they thought if this thing works, because you know what's, what, there's plenty of history that shows that slaves actually left the plantations and took boats on trying to get to Haiti. Because yeah. people talk about the Underground Railroad, sort of like the migration up north. There is evidence of a migration in Haiti where the slaves knew it was quicker. It was shorter, right? right. Haiti is like sort of like a, a short boat right away from the shores of Florida, right? And so all of that matters. People should know that and understand that. Right. And so that pride in my heritage, that pride that having studied the system that oppressed my people and my country and continue to have permeating effect. And, you know, it, you can't, I'm proud to be Haitian. Right. I mean, so many times when we talked about DEI as a spirit of tolerance, which who knows how we got there, but, anyways right, that I needed to be tolerated. I had people say to me, well, you don't look Haitian. And I had to ask, well, how do Haitian look? How do Haitian, you know, what does that even mean? I don't even know what that means, right? right? But the assumptions that people make, and I am just, again, so proud of my heritage, so proud of my story, despite the, the state of my beloved land right yeah. now. And at the same time, I love this country called these United States of America. But yeah. you know what? As um, James Baldwin says, I love America. And there are days when I think America loves me back. But there yeah. are days when I don't think America loves me either. <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we really go through it a lot in so many ways. But no, that, that's great to hear. And, and definitely thank you for providing um, you know, a lot of background in that. Because I know a lot of people you know, sometimes battle with that. Or, you know, some places say, you know, bring yourself to work and we're open along, but you might not, you might not feel that. And I know sometimes that can be a personal battle for someone and it can affect, you know, I think your professional growth if you really can't be your true self in those spaces. So I will say this, right? I have struggled a lot with what people say, bring yourself to work. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm still, I'm, still not all the way bringing myself. Listen, I am a gardener at heart. So my happy space is in scrubs and crops and yeah. hat and gloves digging the earth and planting. Okay. Now, let me just right. be clear. That self does not get to show up as a CEO of a national organization. Yeah. Right. I think that we need to be very careful about what that means and how people think it means or how it can show up. Right. It goes back to where you started Ed. right. About who am I? What are the values that matter to me most? And for me, bringing my whole self to work has always, as I've begun my journey of growth of evolution, right? Because I'm every day I'm evolving. I love the word that Mrs. Obama has put in our consciousness, the idea of becoming, right? Every day, I hope I become a better version of myself, right? And so I say this to say that what I know matters to me the most are two sets of realities. The number one is the order with which I operate my life, right? God first, my family, my broader family, my friends that are my sister friends because I don't have many of them, my community, my career, and then everything else. So you can see that there's an order, right? And so if ever I, now is this something I look at every single day? No, but at the end of a year, if I feel that my family, I have not poured in my family, which includes my husband, my marriage, being married to a strong black man and everything else, I start to feel out of order and I have to adjust and make choices. I make those intentionally every day. 
The second piece are what I call the dimensions of myself. What is it that I want to be in this world, in this life? Truth, love, not the feeling of love, the practice of love and harmony. Those things are important to me. So for me, when I talk about become, you know, being bringing my full self to work or in every spaces, if I got to be in a place where I've got to lie, that's not for me. If I've got to be in a place that is deeply contentious where people are fighting in this idea of zero sum game, et cetera, and you know where that comes from, it's not going to be for me. And that also means that I'm going to be the pacifist, even if sometimes I take shots against myself. Yeah. Right. If I've got a sense, the idea of sacrifice, right, for the greater purpose, I'm willing to do that. And ultimately, this concept of harmony that I think people call about inclusion, but harmony is not assimilation. I'm a lover yeah. of life. As a gardener, I love being outside and I see how this creation is orchestrated with all kinds of different things that are meant to exist together. That's what makes the vibrancy of life. So yeah. when I've been in spaces where people expected me to be a penguin, you know, wear the black suit with the white, I mean, like clearly, you know, yeah. you can see the color I'm wearing. You've seen yeah. me at the convention. Like this is, this is, I think, so people need to really be mindful and thoughtful about what that means. Now, is that person that I described and those priorities show up in every aspect of my life? That's what a life of integrity looks like to me. And I certainly hope so. But I also know that the woman who serves her husband shows up sometimes differently than the CEO of this organization. And yeah. it should, because right. there's a concept that I think we don't talk enough in leadership studies which is the concept of boundaries. Yeah, yeah, for so sure. <laughs> okay, just being my full self does not mean that there are not boundaries. People expect something of me as a president and CEO. And yeah. my husband expects some things as his wife. And for all the women that are listening out there, I'm not ashamed to tell you, my husband does not want to be my husband. He wants me to be his wife. And there's a <laughs> difference. And yeah. I, when I said yes, I'm very clear that I said yes to that. And so being okay when I'm at home or socially, he, you know, I'm his wife, he's not my husband. Yeah. But yeah. then when you know what, I'm in the CEO mode of nada, right. he also is okay. Yeah. Right? Sort of like, how do we do this dance? The, as long as it's in alignment with our order of priorities, and who I am, who I want to be in this life, that's what showing up fully means to me. Yeah, yeah, no. that's, that's, and that's, I'm glad you broke that down because I sometimes joke with my mom about, you know, she's been a manager for years, managing stores, managing for people. And sometimes like, you know, we have planning family things. I'm like, mom, like, you're in manager mode right now. Like, let somebody else plan it, you know? So it's key to hear you say that, that you understand like, you know, okay, when I'm home, this is the space that I'm in because I know it, but I think it happens to the best of us where we could just sometimes, you know, unintentionally take those leadership qualities or take those, you know, way to be uh, approaches at work, take them home, you know, into our home. But it's like, you know, there's a time and place for everything. So definitely thank you for bringing it down. So I think a lot of people, um, you know, uh, would enjoy to hear that and need to hear that, you know, that are probably in those leadership roles, but as well, you know, play a role as a wife, as a mother in the household. Learn great things. I think for the listeners, even myself, I don't have an accounting background. My master's in neither do I. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> so, so master's in human resources. I've had tons of friends at Delaware State who studied accounting. Um, I heard about the struggles of the CPA. Um, I know they got went on to get their jobs. They always talked about the NAVA conference. So just talk about some of the focuses, you know, since you um, you know, went into this role that NAVA is currently focusing on. Again, when I accepted the role of you know being the president and CEO of NAVA. The board wanted somebody to reimagine what now that could be. In fact, I remember one of the things they said to me is, we would love Naba to be part emblazoned in the fabric of American um, yeah. companies like the NAACP or the Thurgood Marshall um, Scholarship Fund. That kind of level is where the board thought about it. So as part of doing our studying and researching, even as part of the search, the thought that accounting is in fact a language, just like music is a language, right? And that we don't write 
different music if somebody's playing a violin or a flute or the piano. It is the same notes, but that musician have this commonality of language that they read that does not look like normal language, which is the language of music. Yeah. And that, in fact, accounting was a language, the language of money, the language of wealth, and the language of business. And that we may be thinking about this a bit too narrowly by thinking about this as the National Association of Black Accountants, which is accounting as a profession, accounting as a field. And to begin to realize that if it is a language, it is in fact an opportunity for us to have a space in tackling deep issues of inequity, such as Black wealth, Black positions in at the helm of organization, be it Fortune 500, Fortune 100, and entrepreneurs, yes. small businesses, to everything in between. And that, you know what, at the end of the day, if we could really instill this thing about understanding money, understanding wealth, understanding business, to everybody that is part of the business community, particularly focused on Black people, yeah. we were on to something that could really have systemic impact and therefore really place the organization in that view that the board had, which is to have an organization that's addressing deep issues. Yeah. And so that's when we decided with the board that who we serve are Black business leaders, all capitalized because that's a core community where you, as somebody in HR, you are a Black business leader, yeah. right? Because your work has a business connotation in it. You should see yourself in NABA just like somebody that is you know a black entrepreneur that's starting a business growing a business should look at nada to have network sort of the idea of engaging the idea of educating having resources right the idea of you know this interconnectedness of building each other up the idea of elevating the voice therefore the issues that are plaguing us and ultimately together rising not only representation of Black in the field of accounting and business, the field of accounting as a profession, but consequently taking the fear of having an accountant or at least enhancing the idea that every person that, you know, we should, we should be engaging with accountants, know how to do that, just like we should be engaging with our doctors, our physician, et cetera, for the wealth of our family business, meaning the household that I run to the businesses that I aspire to run. And that then we are interconnectedly building this place called black business leaders, but we couldn't do that without institutions. Right. The institutions, be it business, <clears throat> academic, government, not other nonprofit, and so on, mm -hmm. we had to do it together and they housed, right? All of us operate within institutions. And yeah. this is also where ally or advocate and those few accomplices also exist. And so that was a way to say, we are focused on black business leaders and yeah. we wanna do this with institution, which is everybody else. And that's where this vision for NABA was born, which merited for us to look at a relaunch, you know, always yeah. will be grateful for all that have come before us to build the National Association of Black Accountants, but to really move the organization forward. As one of our team members says, we honor the past not by replicating it, but by building upon it. Yeah. Right. And so therefore setting our course and our charter for an organization that over the next 50 years will continue to have huge impact, will continue to have a space and broader, deeper, more data centric, more recognized impact. Right, right, right. Okay. Got it. That's great to hear. So that explains it with the conference, like the whole recharge thing. There you go. Got it. There you go. <laughs> 
I was wondering when I got the app, I was like, well, what is this recharge thing coming from? I was definitely thinking that, but you definitely just gave me more insight for sure. Yeah, and the recharge <laughs> also was recognizing that, you know what, it's been a tough two years. Yeah, and as yeah. somebody who's watching the emergence of the BA5 and the BA4, I'm like, please, Lord, let's just like not get to have to be into lockdown again. Right, right. But everybody's tired. And we all needed to be with each other again, right? A community is such a big part of the Black experience. Like we survive because of community, because of each other. So we recognize that individually we needed each other. We needed to recharge. We, we need to recharge with each other. And we wanted to recharge the new vision for NADA. Absolutely. Okay. No, that's great to hear. So, you know, with, with all that and um, all the work that you definitely been, uh, you know, doing and, you know, realizing that you'll have to start, um, in the midst of that, you know, what, what is some advice you will offer? And this is just me personally, you know, a listener, but also working in the HR college recruiting space. Um, for some of those college students that may be listening, you know, what advice would you give to them to kind of make sure they're, you know, taking the right path to really go and uh, start their accounting career? You know, of course, you know, getting a CPA and those type of things, but maybe if it's joining organizations, maybe if it's getting other certifications, what's some advice you could offer to those young people in college? Thank you for that. Um, as a rebel, and you know where my rebel streak comes from, <laughs> I try not to give people advice, particularly at that age, because you know, when I was at that age, ain't nobody could give me no advice. <laughs> You know, it all, it all figured out. <laughs> you know, we, we had it all figured out and continue to, right? right? What I would say, I would encourage people to think a lot, right? If people, if, if you know, as, as I, as people listen to this, hopefully people listen for you, because I'd love to see this grow successful for you. I would encourage people to do the work. And doing the work is not finding the job or, you know, it's not only that, it's doing the work that the conversation that you and I have been having, Ed, who are you? Yeah. Who do you want to be? Who do you aspire to become? What are your priorities in life? What are your dreams that you have the biggest dream? Right? I mean, people used to laugh at me when I told them I was going to be the president and CEO of an organization, mm. Right? Um, very unlikely given the path that I took. But there's a power in this life force that we call God to make dreams come true, right? So what are those dreams that you're dreaming that you think are impossible? They are to dream them. Right. And then when you've done the work, realize that the use of self, right? The use of self, knowing who you are, and you can't be that when it's easy. Right? Everybody can be kind, which kindness is a practice of love. Everybody can be kind when it's easy. But can you still be kind when people come at you? Can you still be kind and firm, kind and stern, kind and tough? Right? That's the work. And you don't get it every time. And it's okay to give yourself then that self-love back of grace to say, hmm. I miss it this time. I'm committed to trying again and to get it better the next time, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that's the work. And I hope that in the process of the work, every black and brown person out there listening to this, if you're not a member of NABA, you gotta be, mm -hmm. right? We've gotta build our black institutions, period. Yeah. Right, we, we, you know, there's so much research and studies that shows, for example, that you know what, a dollar earned in a white community goes through it like how many times before it leaves? Asian community, Latinx community, for us, it's 13 cents. Yeah, yeah. Right, we gotta build a black, we gotta be proud of this organization that is a black founded. Black CEO, Black woman CEO at the service of Black people. She's fallible, she'll make mistakes, but you can't continue to be at each other. We got to be part of it and lift it, right? And learn from things, be a part of it. But then don't be a passive recipient. Get engaged, do what you did. You know, you've got a platform and yeah. you could have easily said, ah, I know this person. But instead you say, I'm going to invite her and have a conversation and offer my platform to her. 
yeah. right? We need to think about these things that we need the young people and then don't participate and not pay your dues. All right. <laughs> yeah. right? Don't say, oh, I'm, I'm a member of NABA because I show up to the meetings. Well, not really. Because yeah. yeah, if really. you're not paying your dues, <laughs> you're not investing in this organization. So yeah. you're going to go pay your fees in your sorority and your fraternity and these other things. Well, then you know what? That's the integrity. You're saying that those things are important to you. Right. Exactly. You've got to be able to invest in this organization, especially that the dues are not outrageous. So yeah. that's what my call to action and my ask would be to anybody that's listening to this. Okay, no, thank you for that. And uh, just goes into my next question, which goes to research. I saw that you all have put in a million dollars on the CLA Foundation and grow back to black talent. So you want to talk about that a little bit? So this is actually, you know, Deloitte started it, you know, we, you know, because they funded in multiple places, it, you know, we didn't announce it right now, but we've announced multiple ways in which Deloitte's supported us. Then the Center for Audit Quality came through with our first million dollar multi-year agreement. And then I'm incredibly grateful to Jen Leary and um, Nancy Brown and the team at CLA for the announcement that we made. And for me, that's when it talks about true active allyship. Yeah. All of these women that I talked about don't look like me, mm -hmm. but they believed and they leveraged their resources, their, 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 you know, they're putting their money where their mouth is. And not only that, but they're advising. They call me up and say, have you thought about this? They make time to think with me. They're part of this journey. And you know what? I'm so grateful for Jen and, um, and Nancy and all of the others that are part of this, right? Because I just think that's how we path and pave a more just world. And so we are committed to building pathways for engaging Black business leaders in community college. I think, Ed, you've heard me say that. I'm a community college kid. Yeah. And I think there's so much Black talent in this institution called community college, yeah. colleges across America. And we can't continue to leave those behind, right? This is not where you tend to see people, fraternities and sororities be. This right. is not where you tend to be professional network to be. And I think what a waste, right? And that's how the elitism, all the ism in this country yeah. and the elitism shows up. Yeah. And so we've decided we're going to heavily focus on community colleges and we're happy to have the resources that's to start that work. Impressive. Yeah, that's impressive. Because I know even down here, um, for a lot of them, there are a lot of different, a lot of community colleges through Miami for a lot of them and that. And, you know, there's talent everywhere. And I think um, that's sometimes, in my experience, I've noticed with some of the diversity efforts, um, you know, you, you focus on the same schools or you focus on the school with the name, but it's like, you got to really go outside the box and find those hidden treasures because it is. That's loud. exactly right. I mean, I didn't go to any of such name school. I went to Nova Northern Virginia Community College yeah. okay. and transferred to George Mason University. And like I tell people, my school has a name, thank God, to a several decades ago men's basketball team who was the yeah. Cinderella story that sort of put us on the map. And then yeah. now most people know about GMU. But JMU is a, is a regional school that used to be a commuter school, right? right? And, so, um, um, and so all of that is also, is, is, is also true, right? That we've got to be thoughtful about where we invest resources. So that's going to be a huge investment for us to begin to build you know, with this work we're doing now in the Mid-Atlantic, it won't surprise you. I go to Nova every chance I get. That's my alma mater and I'm proud to be Nova first, boldly Nova. And then, you yeah. know, I'm looking to see what we learn and continue to explore it everywhere else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's good, that's great. Now, um, I had a question too. I was doing some research about you. Your experience with employer influence strategy, um, you know, that name of that title and all just kind of stuck out to me. I'm um, just like everything we talk about today. Could you kind of talk about employee employee Oh, yeah, absolutely. So this is a term that I give full credit to Europe and its founder, you know, Gerald Tretavian. But the idea is 
as you're seeing more and more the field of ESG evolve, right? Gerald is a brilliant man and he was the first to tap into this to realize that the government is not going to change, governments don't change systems like that, yeah. right? I love how Valerie Garrett says this. It is, um, you know, Valerie Garrett says it, it's this idea of, you know, government stand, sets baseline businesses will have to set the ceiling to which we achieve, we try to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. And so businesses are going to have to shift this. I mean, you already see in Roe v. Wade, businesses that are coming out saying, this is what we're going to do to help with, I mean, like that's going to have to spread. It's going to force a conversation. We're starting to see major healthcare companies sort of challenging what does the law say because they are not able to render services, right? I mean, this is gut-wrenching. Some women who have utopic pregnancies that, are, you know what I mean? Like businesses. And so those are what Gerald intended to call those employers of influence, the one that have the brand the money, the resources, the voice, all of these things to be able to shape our country forward. Absolutely, for sure. I appreciate your time today so much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you so very, very much. Talk to you right. again soon. You stay in touch. Now, are you a member of NABA? I'm, I'm not, but after today, I'm definitely going to join. <laughs> there you go. I love that. You might not will pay for it. So I can't yeah. wait for you to become a member. I get a report. I'm going to look for your name. Otherwise, I'm going to hunt you down, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. I got it. So take care. All right, Ed. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right, bye, -bye.